Good morning. Did you have a good week last week? Or was it a battle like mine? I'm refreshing today. Good morning to all of you online, uh, Benaya Community Church, Olivet Baptist Church online, uh, others that are watching us that have been part of the family now, and of course all of you that are in person. Um, we have provided for you some songs for those of you online, the list that will be played today, so you can download them and watch them along with the outline. We are finishing up the last sermon in the series of Listening to God's Voice today, so this will be the final one. We hope now that you would uh, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you as you worship the Lord, uh, whether you're at home or in person. There's another guest here sitting in this chair it's the wonder that's who we're worshiping today him jesus christ the righteous so let's go wes
morning, everybody. Uh, we'll do our devotion to come out of the Old Testament be First Chronicles, chapter twenty-nine. That's First Chronicles, chapter twenty-nine, and verse starting at verse ten. Wherefore, David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thy, O Lord, is the greatest in the power, at, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth. And thine is, is the kingdom. O Lord, thou art excellent and has all the, above all. Both riches and honor come from thee, and reign over all. And in all thy hands is power and might. And in all hand is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. May the word of God have the rich in your heart. So. Amen. Amen. Our New Testament scripture comes from 1 Timothy. first chapter, starting at the 12th verse. This is the first letter that Paul had wrote to Timothy. And we find these words in the first chapter of the 12th verse. It's first Timothy. I think Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a per persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, who I am the worst. But for this very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal immortal, invincible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you had done for us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, what you all that you had done for me. Heavenly Father, we re just read the scripture about who we once was, a sinner, someone that was lowly, who was rude and mean. And you took the time to nurture me, to nurture us, and change our lives. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for your saving grace, because you've done it all by your grace, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we, we hear songs about mercy and grace and how powerful that it is. But it's all for us, Heavenly Father. And we thank you, Lord. Even at this time when your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, you have shown us mercy and you have shown us grace. Oh, gracious God, continue to allow us to, to work for you. We are your servants, Heavenly Father. And this day, at this time, we come to worship you right now to give you the praise for what you had done for us. It is an individual thing that we do collectively, Heavenly Father. We come this morning to hear your word to be preached. We come this morning to sing thy songs. We come this morning to show gladness for one another. We, we come this morning for rejuvenation. We come this morning, Heavenly Father, to be revived so that we could go out and let somebody know that we know someone that can help them also, Heavenly Father. 
We thank you, Lord, for all that you have done, and we thank you for this time right now. And we ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, eternal God, we're so grateful again, Lord, that we have this privilege and opportunity to come into your presence this morning. We give you thanks, Heavenly Father. We give you all honor and we give you all glory for what you're about to do in our lives. What you're about to do, Heavenly Father, through the word and the gospel that be preached today. And Lord, we pray that within our heart, with the love that we have for you, that we would receive what you have for us today. And that we would celebrate this as we leave today. Not forgetting that it was given out of love for your son, Jesus. But given, Lord, that you've done it for us because you saw what we needed in the state of mind that we were in. And we couldn't do nothing but today is to praise you and glorify your holy and righteous name. May we give as we can and may we uplift you in all that we do. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
sitting here this morning and I'm smiling because have you ever watched a sporting event and not look at the players but look at the audience? I mean, they're like high-fiving each other. They don't even know each other. They're going down the row, high-fiving, shouting. Get the same people in church. They change even the way they talk. They, they, they greet instead of saying, hey, how you doing? They're, how art thou? Like it's some more holiness to it. And very, uh, nah, you know, you got to like relax here and you're worshiping, right? Uh, so this morning again, we're going to take four more names that describe the nature of our Savior. And after that, we're going to take the sheet that we used last week that says glorify his name. Do you remember that? If you need one or didn't bring it, you can raise your hand and an usher will give it to you here. If you're online, it's already there. You used it last week. We're going to use it every Sunday this month. The purpose of this is that when you and I have our own personal time, we're going to go through this pie. There are 12 sections. We're taking the first one. We did the study months ago. Now we're going to apply it, which is the big part. And you can do this right in your own home. You don't have to do it verbally at home. You can do it in your mind if you would like. But for today, I'm going to need you to do what you did last Sunday. When we get to this point of glorifying God's name, setting it up apart strictly as an object of worship, and these names that you have a list of demonstrate who he is and what he does for you. And now we're going to worship him in that moment during the altar prayer. We're going to be praising him and giving him glory. You with me on that? And you have the sheet. I just need you to verbalize it. You don't have to raise your hand just as the Lord puts it on your heart. Two people may say different things at the same time. That's fine. And then I'll close us when we get to that point. Okay? And the game plan is in one year, you're going to have a lot to pray for personally. 12 sections that are biblically sound. All right, so let's go before our Lord, shall we? Father, again, we, it amazes me that there are over 800 names that describe you. And it's been a learning experience for me and I'm sure others to start marching through taking four names a Sunday and each one describing a different look about you, demonstrating your nature again and, and what you do. Those names dictate what you do for us. That's amazing. And so we want to uplift you this morning and glorify your name because of it. And the four that we're going to look at again this morning, the first one comes from Psalm 27.1. It calls you the stronghold of my life. What a name. It's indicative of who you are in relationship to us. You're our rock. You're our stronghold. Not our material things, but you. Psalm 31.3 calls you a stronghold of salvation. Save us from what? From our sin nature, from our sin, from death, from depression, from discouragement, from being hopeless. A stronghold of salvation. The third name comes from Psalm 99.4. It's not coincidental that they're coming from this book of worship, Psalms. And 99.4 calls you a strong king. We look at this and now this is flexing time. Stronghold of my life. Stronghold of salvation. Strong king. And Psalm 89, 8 calls you a strong Lord. Very appropriate. In fact, the strongest man in the world. 
one who could take nothing and create galaxies. And we're sweating sometimes the little things in our life, like whether or not you can do it. But now we want to allow those online and in person to share in this moment of glorifying you. And there are some descriptive names that we have handed out online and in person. We want to give everyone a chance to participate in this one. It's not a professional service. It's people coming in to worship the wonder who is in our presence. So as the Lord leads you online or in person, feel free to pick some of these names on this sheet and verbalize it. Tell the Lord, I praise you for, and pick a name. Lord, I praise you for being a safe leader. heard your folks that's really amazing to me and I can't do anything better than what you've heard so we dedicate this service to you this morning you've heard your people even those online that we cannot ver hear audibly. But what a time to praise you. So I'm going to close it out. We give you glory because you're the wonder. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn it over to the officers. That was fun, wasn't it? Yes, it was.
pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity for our tithes and offering. Lord, bless those who gave. Lord, bless those who had the desire to give but could not. Use this to uplift your son, Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen.
after that, we can just dismiss and go home, don't you think? Man, thank you, Wes. Uh, I do have some news. I was going to hold off and not share it with you for six months, but um, we may have an opportunity. We, I'm talking about Benaya Community Church Online, all of it here in Ventura, to partner with a group of African-American students from UCSB. What I'm trying to do is get them to come here and share their, um, their situation. Uh, they're not asking for money or anything like that. They're already doing stuff. But it's a unique group, uh, young intellectuals that are doing something really amazing. So I'm going to see for February, if we can get them in here, some of them, and share. Uh, it's a biblical principle, and these young men and women are doing it. And I'm pretty intrigued. So if it works out, uh, it'll be something that maybe Olivet, a historic black church, would be interested in doing. Uh, that being said, ready to go to work? Me too. All right. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew chapter 7. This is the last sermon, if you're watching online as well, in the series of listening to God's voice. This will be it, and then we'll move next Sunday back to Isaiah 9-6 and look at the other four names about the wonder. Uh, all right. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. I'm reading from the NIV version. Here it is. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for the living word of God. We thank you for the Holy Spirit and an aspect of his ministry for each Christian is to take the truth that he has penned through holy men of God and illuminate it, make it easy for us to understand, and then as a counselor to be able to apply it to each individual heart. That's our request and prayer this morning. May he have his way and may he make this word be real. May he give us depth in understanding, and may he display his power that you, Jesus, would get the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So in my introduction, I got two questions that I'm going to pose to you, but I'm going to answer them. So they're sort of rhetorical. Like number one, what is a parable? That's the first question that we're going to address as by way of introduction. And then I'll tip you when we get to the outline. What's a parable? And then the second question is, why does Jesus use them? Okay, so we got two questions on the table here. He uses a parable. Why does he use that method of teaching? Why doesn't he just talk straight uh, and, and give us the facts? And um, what is a parable? So let me answer the first. What is a parable? A parable is a story with hooks. Okay, it's a person giving a story with hooks that the listener as he or she listens to the story, begins to identify with aspects in the story, ergo the hook or hooks, okay? Um, as he or she is listening, those hooks will pop up and they're either people in the story or their situations in the story. And as the listener starts to hear, they go, oh, that's me. Uh-oh, that's me. 
I can identify with that person. So it's like when someone tells a joke. Have you ever had a person tell a joke and you miss it? Yeah, you know, and they're laughing and you're like, I don't get it. You, you miss the hooks, okay? That's the idea. And so a parable is a way to share truth through a story by giving hooks and let the person begin to attach themselves to which person or situation represents them. At the end of the parable, though, there's always a push for the hearer to make a decision, okay? When Jesus uses it, at the end, he tells this story. It's got the hooks, and you get enamored in the story, but always at the end of the parable, there's a push to make a certain decision, and it's up to the hearer to figure that one out. Now, that's the application point of the parable. So let me give an example. Remember, that you hear preachers talk about this all the time. The four soils, remember the soils? There's a, that's another parable, okay? The push at the end of the four soils, after he lists them, is be good soil. Don't be the other three, be good soil. Why? Because the word falls on good soil and grows. Be like that. See, that's the push. So you see it? So we're because we're gonna deal with the parable here. And we want to we want to have these points ready, these benchmarks. Now, why would Jesus use this style? He didn't always use this style. He flipped into this style a year and a half into his ministry. So he had a three-year ministry, and halfway through it, he flips into parables. Why? The reason why, there are two reasons why you use the parables. And one is to hide truth. What do you mean? Hide it from the fake folks that, uh, that aren't really interested. They just want to cause problems. Well, who are those folks, uh, Pastor Ananias, in the Bible? They're the preachers, the Pharisees the teachers of the law that always kept coming after Jesus, trying to trick him, trying to get an explanation, trying to, you know, corner him and something. And he finally got tired of it. And he said, you know what? I'm done. You guys don't want it, want to play games? Play this game. And now he flips into the parables. So the first part is to hide truth. The second part is to reveal truth. Well, how does that work? Because you have folks that want the truth, and they'll get the parable. But then you got the jerks that are in the audience that are playing games, and they don't want the truth, and guess what's going to happen? They're not going to get it. They'll be like listening to the joke and go, huh? That's what's going to happen. So, that being said, it leads us to our theme, a well-built life. Introductory comments. So here we go. Number one, in this particular parable, Jesus confronts us. Jesus confronts us with the simple truth that each of us is building a life. I'll give it to you again, that part, and then we'll finish it off. In this particular parable, Jesus confronts us with the simple truth that each of us is building a life and its soundness is based on hearing his voice and acting on it. All right, you with me so far? So the, the, this whole thing is about hearing his voice and acting on it. You and I are building lives. Every individual is building a life. Even the unsaved, they're building a life. And the essence of making the right choices and being a sound life, a well-built life, is going to be based on hearing his voice and acting on it. Jesus wanted these multitudes, and that's where they were at when he was talking, that gathered on the hillside to understand something. 
this not he's not delivering a you know you people deliver popular sermons and then uh, they go great message that's not what he's about here he's not interested in hearing that he's giving them divine truth to be immediately implemented in his life in their life and to be a part of their life that's what he's interested in he wanted them to get it and the first thing he's doing in this parable is looking broadly he's saying you got a choice now you're going to either have a well-built life or a poor built life and humanity's going to build their own lives and it behooves people to make critical right decisions and he'll explain it as we look at the parable number two the final push the final push is verse 29 and verse 29 of matthew 7 and here's what it here's what it states because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. Well, what a slam that is. So the crowds were amazed at his teaching, and the push is, listen to me. Now, they're already amazed at what he's saying, and, and we're going to unpack it here in a second. But you have two choices with this parable you, and two different results. Do them, he said, and your life will be solid on a solid foundation. Don't listen to my teaching. You hear it and don't do it, and your life's going to be worthless. You're building on a foundation. One is solid, one is soft, and the choice is going to be yours. Let me ask you. How do you think you're building on your life? That would be a question that we should all examine ourselves. Some people, it's interesting when you look at humanity, we have a really good way of putting up a facade. Have you ever noticed that? And have you ever noticed you look at people and you think, man, they got the life. They travel to Europe, they go over here, and then all of a sudden the bottom drop, drops out and you read about something and you go, whoa, I thought they... I thought everything was perfect with them. And, and it, it, well, let's take one. I mean, we got a lot to pick one, you know, a lot of options. Let me go with P. Diddy. So all of a sudden, his life is unraveling. And storms have hit. And things are coming out. And I remember looking at him going, man, this guy's got the life. He flies to Europe. He's on the red carpet. I mean, everything. What does he want? He goes. If he wants it, he has it. Now I feel bad for him. And what it showed me is the external facade that people, I'm not just, I'm not slamming him, but people give and we walk away outwardly thinking they got it together. Inwardly, they're on the verge of collapse. That's most of us. And people deceive all the time. It happens. We do it. You know, how are things going? Oh, great. And, you know, all hell's breaking loose at home. But, you know, shh. You know, I mean, that's what we do, right? Um, notice, verse 20, notice verse 24 in our parable. These are just benchmarks, and then we're going to hit it. Um, verse 24 starts out with a key word, therefore. You see it? And, and then he says, everyone. So now here's what Jesus has just done. What a teacher. He has put this word there because Jesus didn't want anybody who's hearing this to think he or she is an exception and it won't happen to them. That's what he's saying. He's saying, get this straight. This includes everybody that's living. There, no one escapes this principle that he's sharing, and we're going to look at it. All right? Now, what have we covered so far? Ten sermons. I'm going to hit them really quick about listening to God. We said that God still talks today. He talks through his word, the Holy Spirit, Christians, and circumstances. That was the first big one. Then we said in, that God's goal in communicating are his truths. 
Then we said that um, God now wants to get our attention since he wants to talk to us, and he does that by allowing trials. Things happen. Then we talked about identifying. Is it possible to identify God's voice? It is, we looked at. Then we looked at the factors that, that um, determine how God communicates to you and I. Then we talked about listening. Then we talked about meditation, that still small voice flooding our mind. Then we talked about having a spiritual mindset. Then we talked about hindrances to hearing God's voice. Then we talked about listening and obeying. Now we got the last message, a well-built life. And it's going to depend on how we hear God. Roman numeral number one, here we go on the outline. The requirements for a well-built life. Under A, how do we do it? Okay, Pastor Ananias, you're talking about a well-built life. Well, you need to give me more than that. You need to talk to me, how do we do it? That's A, how do we do it? And the answer is following. Number one, we must hear the word of God. We must hear the word of God. You got two options, a well-built life and a bad li a bad built life, if you want to use that terminology. And so let's take a look at how we build a well-built life. And the first text, proof text that we have is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, you can jot it down, uh, verses 16, 17. Let me read it. It says, all scripture. See, the Bible uses words we're not supposed to use. All, never. And here, now, here's what he's saying. All skip, scripture. Old Testament, New Testament. It's all there. And he's saying all scripture is God-breathed. That means it's a living word from the living God and is useful for, now look what scripture does, teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Verse 17, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so that's what the word does. I, I, two days ago, I was listening to a, a 20-year-old kid and also a 27-year-old uh, um, female Olympic runner. And they had such a maturity when they spoke. And I didn't know until the very end of the video that they were both believers and they shared it. And I thought, wow. In fact, I even told my youngest daughter, I said, you need to check this out. This kid's 20 and he just got called up to the major leagues in baseball. Listen to the interview well beyond his years. And that's what happens when the word of God is placed in our lives, and we hear it and act upon it. Second proof text, Psalm 19, verses 7 and 8. Psalm 19, yeah, 19, verses 7 and 8. Two verses, and the psalmist again follows this up, and here's what he says. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. There you go. That's what happens with the living word of God. The purpose of scripture is to build principles in our life. That's the reason for scripture, to take God's truth, absolute truth, which a lot of people don't like to hear, and it builds, the purpose of it is to build principles from those truths and put them in our life. That's the goal. Now, what that necessitates from the pulpit, you better have a teacher. Everybody knows that Jesus saves. Okay, I got it. Now talk to me. My life still goes on. I still got struggles. 
and I still have issues that I need to address. And what and who does it? The Word of God, Christ himself. Another proof text, Joshua chapter 1. I think this was read by one of the deacons a couple of Sundays ago. Joshua 1, 7 through 8. Listen to this again, and we have the same thing. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. So again, the enduring life is built with principles of God's word. It's the person who builds these into his or her life by giving careful attention to scripture. And when you can do that, you can endure. Most Christians today are soft, I'll be honest. Crisis happen and everybody unravels. Why? Probably not enough of the word being built in his or her life. Look at Colossians 3.16. Colossians chapter 3, 16. And here's what it says. 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. So, number two. You have number one, now we have number two here. We must obey the word of God. It's not just reading it and hearing it. It's, and when I say obey, are we going to be perfect? No, but I'm talking application here. That's what the word means. That once you read it, you try to apply it. And you ask God to help you. Oh, here's the principle. I'm not doing it. Let me apply it. That's the application point. So let me give you two scriptures that will reinforce this thought. One is from Psalm 119. Uh, this is, um, I got a bunch of verses, but they're, they're all over the place from this one. So let me just read them and you can jot them down as I read them. Uh, Psalm 119, the first two are verses one and two, and then put a comma, verses one and two. Blessed are those Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. Now, the, the word blessed means happy. Happy is him. Happy is her who does this. Now, the next uh, verse, verse 24, same psalm. Verse 24, it says, your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. Huh? Yeah. The truth are our counselors. And then verses 33 and 34. Teach me, O Lord, to follow your decrees. Then I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding and I will keep your law and obey it with all my heart. And then verses 71 and 72. Same psalm. It is good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your word. Wow. Verse 72. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. And then the last one. Verse 165. Verse 165. Great peace have they who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. I mean, you could take this verse and these verses, and there's your devotional for the whole week, and just meditate on these truths and talk to God about them. Last one, Luke. This one I had to smile at. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. These are one of these verses that you don't hear a lot about, I actually read it as I'm going through Luke. 
And I thought, oh my goodness, I've never heard this. Um, Luke 11, verses 27. I want you to check out 27 and then watch Jesus' response in 28. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. You ever heard that verse? I mean, okay, now look at his response, though. He replied, Blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Ooh, so there's the push again, hearing the word and obeying it. We'll get to the parable in a second. So what Jesus is saying is, more than what that lady said, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. In other words, wise men and women will hear principles and apply them. That's the wise person. The question for you and I is, do we do that when we hear them? Because Jesus is going to talk about the person that hears and walks. So Jesus said a foolish person doesn't apply anything. They just hear and leave. Roman numeral two. The reasons for a well-built life. Now someone described a Christian or the Christian life as this. Here, uh, heading into a storm being in a storm, or coming out of a storm. How about that? What do you think about that? I mean, that this is how they describe the Christian life. You're either heading into a storm, or you're already in it, or you're coming out of it. Now, I don't know about you, but when I heard that saying, I went, wow, yeah, I'm one of these three, we just changed the days, you know, and I'm in here somewhere, you know. So this is where we want to look at the reasons then we want to have a well-built life. Under A, here it is, the first reason. For a well-built life is storms are inevitable. They're coming. I mean, we can't stop them. People, I, I know you hear some preaching that say, well, once you, you accept Jesus, Everything is fine. No, that's not it. If anything, it gets worse because now you've went from death to life. Now you got the enemy after you, you know? So these storms are going to come. They're inevitable. Please recognize that. Jesus didn't say in our text, if it rains, if it floods, if the wind blows, he did not use that word if and make it a conditional statement. He said, when the floods come, when the storms come, when the wind blows. So that's a tip for you and I that guess what? Storms are coming in our life. And we see it in verse 25 of our text and verse 27. They're unavoidable storms that come. Well, let me give you some examples. If you're married, they're coming in your marriage. They will be there. Now, you can put the facade on and smile and go, no, I don't have any. Yeah, right. We know better because the truth, we just heard it. They're going to come. Finances, there are going to be storms there. And we can all say at some point, we've had those. Disappointments. Yep, health issues. Yep, these are storms. And Jesus said, they're coming. Now, they come in every aspect of life. And it, it doesn't even matter if you say, I'm going to build a solid foundation or on a weak foundation. Let's say that you don't want to buy any of this. You're listening online. I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe in Jesus. I'm just looking to poke holes in your, your uh, statements. Okay, that's fine. Storms are still coming, dog. They're going to come to you as well as they come to me. They're coming to everybody. Remember what, what Jesus said earlier? Therefore, everyone, nobody escapes this. Storms, not, now you have a number one. Storms are also uncontrollable. 
Not only are they inevitable, they're uncontrollable. We have no control over them. They come. John 3, 8 is our proof text. Let me read it. 3, 8, and it says, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You don't know. Where does the wind go after it blows? You don't know. You can't control it. You and I have no control. We face many circumstances that we don't have any control of. The only thing we can control is how we build our life. And how our lives are built will determine whether we crumble when the storms come or hold fast. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to unravel. I want to get better at letting the storms come and be able to endure them. There's a reason for it. Look at 1 Corinthians, it's letter B, 1 Corinthians 10.4. Another proof text. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, and here's what it says. And the backdrop is, the, is uh, Israel's history. Paul is writing, by the way, we're going to be starting this book on Wednesday night, this coming week. So 1 Corinthians, here we come. We'll eventually get here, but it says they ate, or number four, they drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock, that, ac that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. So that's the idea. A well-built life has a solid foundation, and that solid foundation is the rock, Christ himself. A well-built life is, a, is not the physical rock. It's the eternal rock. Second reason, letter B. The second reason for a well-built life is comprised of, first blank, comprised of lasting, enduring substance. Lasting, enduring substance. Now, this, that's an interesting term. Let me give you the proof text first. I'll make some quick comments. Isaiah um, chapter 40 is our text. You can write it down. Chapter 40, verse 8. And here's the statement, really true. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God stands forever. So the substance of the word is eternal. It's the imperishable building material that God uses in our lives. Remember, we're building a foundation and it's spiritual it's eternal. And the Word of God is our imperishable building material. That's how we build our eternal house, if you will, the inner man. And so we should be governed. And if you're listening, young people, here we go now. We should be governed by principles of Scripture. What are our options in this? In fact, I'll throw it out to the university students that are watching. You got two shots at this. You either are going to be governed by the truth, the absolute truth of the Word of God, or you're going to take your professor, your friend, your own ideas, and be governed by that. That's it. One will be biblical. The other will be secular. Those are your two options. And why am I saying this? Because Christianity is a worldview. That means it hits, I hate this question when people say, well, you know, religion is a private thing. Really? Well, you know, religion, we're talking about Christianity. Do you know Christianity invented government? It came from the Old Testament. Do you know why it invented government? Because man has a fallen nature, and if he doesn't have restrictions, he's going to go haywire. We got government, and man is still going haywire. So now you telling me that that's in my closet? I just think about, no, it's a worldview. It handles every aspect of our life. 
how to be a good child, how to be a good parent, how to be a good spouse, how to be a good Christian. I mean, and the subject matter is across the board, geology, science, philosophy. That's a worldview, dog. That's not something you do in your closet for Sunday. And so young people, again, how you build in your life? What are you using? Are you using secular truth or absolute truth? Are you using fake reality or objective reality? Those are some key issues. Also, we are spiritual beings. Please don't forget that. You are not just physical. You are spiritual. You have a mind, emotions, and will, and guess what? Those are not in the organs. Those are in the spirit and the soul. So what are you going to be? One dimensional? I only live in the material. I see that at the gym. Though those are, and I'm there. One dimensional. If that's all you got is the weights, you're only working on the external. Man is more than that. Man is physical and spiritual. But guess which lasts longer? (laughs) The spiritual. Because the body gets old. It's like an old suit after a while. Then the holes come. Then the suit's outdated. And then you got to throw it away. Then we have funerals. And what keeps living? What you're building on. The spiritual. The eternal. Number two. John 14. John 14, 2 and 3. John 14, verses 2 and 3. And here it is. 2 and 3. Come on, 2. Here we go. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. So you and I are building on something that is eternal, the real you. And the only thing that you can use to build the building material is the Word of God. That's it. 1 Corinthians, number 3, 1 Corinthians 10, 15. This is what Satan will try to do. 1 Corinthians 10, 15. To any person, young or old, This is his game. He's going to try to get you to defer from building on the spiritual. Verse 15, let me read it uh, uh, to you. Verse 15. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Here's what Jesus is saying. You got physical and you got spiritual. And what you're building on is going to be eternal. That's what's going to last. Now, you're, here's what he's saying, and I love it. You don't need the preachers for this. You're smart. What do you think? You're going to die. You Physically, we're not going to be here. So what do you think? Well, then the question is, do we have a spirit? Now, that's for you now to investigate. You got a mind. Where does that come from? The brain? That's the organ. You can think and not tell anybody. Plato said that's the soul talking to itself. Now you've got to determine whether those statements are correct. But keep in mind, Satan wants you to focus on the external and not about building a well-built life. Now, let her see. Third reason to build our houses our lives, well, is to, and here's the first blank, avoid the inescapable consequences. Avoid the escapable, inescapable consequences of poorly built houses. Give it to you again. A third reason to build our house, and by that I'm, re- I'm referring to our lives, To build our houses well is to avoid the inescapable consequences 
of poorly built houses. Jesus made the comment that the individual who decides to build on sand will lose everything. It's in the parable. When the storm hits, he's going to lose. Why? Here's why. He hears the word, but he ignores it. That's the dilemma. You ever heard that song? Uh, I, I should have Googled it, but I can't. I forgot. But I'm looking at my notes now. I can hear the tune. It's old school. Everybody plays the fool sometime. I forget who, what the who the group is. All right. And I'm thinking, man, you can do that with relationships, but you better not do it with the truth. Because if you and I play the fool for this truth, we're going to get washed out at the end of the day when the storm hits, and it's coming. It's coming. We're getting little ones now. The big one will come. And if, we're, if our house isn't prepared with eternal truth, we're going to be washed away in it. And it happens because we hear the voice of God and we ignore it. You don't want to be that way. All right, Roman numeral three. The rewards. What do I get for this, Pastor Ananias, if I'm doing what you're talking about? Well, here we go. What are the rewards of a well-built life? Good question. Under A, the rewards. Let's take a look at them. Then we're done. The rewards. Number one, first, we endure the storms. That one I like. In other words, we don't fold. We don't get washed away. So we en endure the storm of finances when we're struggling. We, we endure the storm of marital issues if you're married. We endure whatever those storms are, we endure them. You know, again, you've heard people say, this too shall pass, all right? You en and you're not just barely enduring them, no. You can endure them and get through them and learn from them. Number two, Second, we have the capacity to enjoy the pleasures of life. What do you mean by that? If I'm going through the storm, I'm going to have pleasure? Um, yeah, that, how, how does that work? Okay, let me explain it. The person that has a well-built life in his or her life, out of the substance of God's word, principle after principle after principle, has the ability to have the peace of God despite the storms. You know what that means? You get to enjoy life because you're you have God's supernatural peace. Even when the bat when the storms are just leveling stuff, you're getting through those storms. So usually what happens is when storms come, people unravel, right? They can't enjoy anything. They can't even enjoy a meal because they're not hungry anymore because they got a storm raining hell down on them, right? So they can't sleep. They can't eat. They don't feel like watching a movie. They don't want to go for a walk. Why? Because chaos is in their life. But God says, if you build your life by the principles, you have a well-built foundation, guess what? You got my peace now. Now let's roll through these storms. And the peace sustains you and I through what? Through the heartaches, through the difficulties, through the trials. See how it works? And then guess what that does? That allows me to enjoy the pleasures of life. I'm winning on this. Do I like it? No. But you know what? I know that God's working. His peace, he's given it to me. And I'm maneuvering through it. And, and you know, the best thing is, nobody would even know I'm going through trials. Why? Because God is sustaining me through them. I'm enduring through them. I'm actually looking at the trial and learning. So I don't keep repeating the same thing. See? Number Three, a life that is well-built will enrich the lives of others. 
All right, Pastor Ananias, tell me, explain this one. You're saying that as I'm going through the storm, as I'm going through the, the flood and the wind is blowing, that if I'm building into my life these biblical eternal principles that I am now able to enrich somebody else? Exactly. How? With the overflow into their life will come from us. They will look at you and you will minister to them. I'll give you a great example. Uh, many years ago, I was at a funeral and it actually happened from a cousin of mine in Greece. I never forgot it. We're at this funeral and she's a believer. Most Greeks are like, I get in trouble saying this, but this is the best way I can say it. Greeks, most Greeks are Greek Orthodox, like Mexicans are Catholic, the majority. Then you have the evangelicals. She was an evangelical Christian, which is a really, really small minority in Greece. Okay. And um, we're at a funeral. And the conversation came up. I just overheard it in passing. I wasn't doing the funeral. I was there. And she made a comment. The person said, you know, we're talking about dying. And here's what she said. And I'm just walking by and I overheard it. She said, I'm jealous. And it, it was like somebody drove a stake through me. I went... Listen to that one. You're jealous. You can't wait to die to get to Jesus. And I had to admit, I do this for a living and I'm not there yet. And that statement by that individual so ministered to me that it was the overflow from her life to mind saying, whoa, I want to be like that. I want to sit there and go, yeah, let's do this thing. You know, I mean, that I never forgot. And even when I do funerals today, in my mind, I'm thinking about it. And about that statement, she never even, to this day, she doesn't know how it's influenced me. So we become change points. When we overflow into other people's lives, we become change points in their lives. They change as a result of us living the life. It's an influence. They want what we want. See? And it works. Number four, a well-built life is continuing spiritual growth. A well-built life is is continuing, three blanks, continuing spiritual growth. When the storms are over, we can praise God for his faithfulness. And guess what that ha what happens? We continue to grow. We continue to develop as a result of what? Building a well-built life by hearing God's voice. That's the critical part. We got to hear the voice. That's the word in our personal time. That's what we're learning in that prayer circle when we get to those segments during the altar prayer. So my question as I close, how will you play the game of life? God is still speaking. We have 10 sermons on that one. So let us choose the wise foundation to build our lives by listening to his voice and applying his principle. We have a hand in the back. Yes. A1. Num number three. Do I have a 3A? I got three. I said... Uh, a life that is well-built will enrich the lives of others, but that's all I have in my notes. I do have an A. Well, I must see, I must be, I'm getting old because I don't have it in my notes. Um, I'll, I'll look at that and give it to you next, next uh, Sunday. 
You have it? Okay. All right. We'll talk, Sister Brown. You know what I like, though? Look, you all want it. See, it's not a show. This is worship and learning and growing. The end of the day, it's how we apply it. So I appreciate the hand. I appreciate that because it tells me that you want it and we all want it. And so uh, let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for, for this series that you gave us on hearing the voice of God. I, I know for me, you've already started last night to say, don't put away the notes now. It's not done. I got to remind myself of things. I got to pick aspects of these 10 or 11 sermons and review them so that I can keep practicing them so I can get good at it. I mean, really, when you, when you sit down and think about it, Lord, the most important thing is how to hear your voice. I mean, we can read the Bible. I get that. And that's critical. But then I want to hear you talk. And then I want to be quiet and let you, as you talk to me, guide me and talk to me and teach me. I want that two-way conversation that every Christian is so close to having. If we just apply these 10 major areas that we've been looking at. So my prayer for us online and in person is that we start to apply these principles on hearing God's voice. And your parable gives us the reason. We don't want to just hear and ignore because then we're building lives of sand that are worthless. We want to hear and we want to apply so that we can build strong, eternal foundation in our life. Then the pay for that is that when the storms come in the parable, we can endure them. We can learn from them. We can enjoy the pleasures of life despite the circumstances of those storms. That's what we want. So, Lord, the push, be a wise builder. It's there. And my prayer is for those online and myself and others that we be wise builders of that eternal spiritual life that you have given us. And Holy Spirit, help us when we get a little tired. Help us when we start to falter. And as we review a year from now, if it's your grace that we're still living, boy, I hope that we're way down the road in our walk with you. May you get the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Next Sunday, we're going back to Isaiah 9-6. We're going to look at the other four names, one at a time. And then we get to go back to depression. And that cause, the cause we'll be looking at are trials, of all things, and Philippians. So, ready to go home? No, you're still pondering the message? All right, good. That's good. You got all week to do it. Let's stand and I'll dismiss us. Holy Spirit, again, you display your power. You make it really easy for me to get and for others. Now, the other part is we're not robots. We have a free will because we're made in your image. Now, we got to choose start to do the application. 
So Holy Spirit, you, you counsel each person in the areas that they need it. The same for myself. And we thank you for answering our prayer. Now to the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.